Okay, Eric, so I'm at Costco the other day, and the checkout guy says, you want a box for those items, sir? And I told him I hate violence, and I would just rather use my credit card. Get it? (laughs) (laughs) It's the Paperback Warrior Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the 77th episode of the Paperback Warrior Podcast. My name's Eric, and we're a vintage paperback discussion show focusing on genre fiction from the mid-20th century. The podcast is an outgrowth of our amazing blog at paperbackwarrior.com, where you can read new reviews of old books every day with an archive stretching back for years. Best of all, our content is completely free of charge. Let me introduce my broadcast partner, Tom, to talk about what's happening today. Tom, you over there? Yes. For today's feature, I'm going to talk about the genesis of hard-boiled fiction, going back nearly 100 years to an author named Carol John Daly and his wildly successful character, Race Williams. Now, listener, even if you aren't into fiction that vintage, I'd encourage you to listen to it because it really sets the stage for the books and authors that you read today. It's going to all make sense when I explain it. Just please stick with me. I'm also going to be reviewing a book called The Da Vinci Rose, written under the pseudonym Archie O'Neill in 1973. Eric, what is your review today? Today, I'm going to be reviewing The Big Kiss Off by Day Keen. It's a Stark House reprint that I'm really excited to talk about. All right, cool. Before we get into all that, it's been about a month since we did super fan shout outs, and it's really important that we thank our patrons on the air. Eric, why don't you go ahead and quarterback that part? All the content at Paperback Warrior is free to read and listen, but we do ask our fans to make financial donations if they have the money and inclination. This is done through the PayPal link in the upper right-hand corner of the paperbackwarrior.com homepage, the desktop version, not the mobile version. These donations help defray the costs associated with running the show and the website. Yeah, these donations to the show, they make it possible for us to continue uh, doing the show without selling ads or hiding our content behind a paywall. And uh, each month, we'd like to thank the super fans who donate money to make this show possible. So this month, we want to recognize the following super fans for keeping the lights on here at Paperback Warrior headquarters so the rest of you deadbeats can listen for free. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, we got David Kowalski, Frank Hill, James Cooper, and Rin LeBlanc. Uh, thanks for that. And uh, speaking of super fans, I am a longtime super fan of a blog called Pulpetti, spelled P-U-L-P-E-T-T-I. It's at pulpetti.blogspot.com. It's written by a guy in Finland named Juri Numelin. Numelin? Something like that. Something like that. He's been doing the blog for years, and every time I read it, I I find myself learning something. So Juri reached out for me recently looking for help, and I'm going to have to turn to the Paperback Warrior listener hive mind to solve this mystery. Here's what we got. Last week, we did a feature on a prolific author of paperback fiction named Ralph Hayes. If you haven't heard the episode, you should go back and listen because it is an audio masterpiece. Anyway, Jury is trying to identify the American titles of two Ralph Hayes books for which he only has the Finnish or Finland translations. Jury is writing a book on American Slee's paperbacks, and he needs to identify these titles for his book. Okay, so let me give you the the books. Mystery book number one was in Finland titled to Smiling Lips. Mm. In the book, there is a young doctor in a hospital, in the hospitals nearby where farmers or agriculture workers are protesting something. Some farmers get hurt in the demonstration, And the hospital takes in the wounded farmers. There's a lot of romance and sex, including lesbian scenes that I'm sure are totally realistic. Jury needs to know what the American title of this book is. Now, the book says it's written by Ralph Hayes. Okay, so that's book number one. The Finland mystery book number two, the title translates into Unvirtuous Wife, also purportedly written by Ralph Hayes. It takes place on a horse ranch in Texas. The main character is a hot babe who is tending the farm while her husband is away fighting in Vietnam. She's getting pressure from the bank who wants to foreclose on the farm, and so the lady starts banging the banker to get him to forego his plans to foreclose. 
A mysterious stranger also helps her financially in exchange for oral favors from the wife. Then the husband comes back from the war, and the book ends with a big shootout. So what I did is I wrote a letter to Ralph Hayes in Michigan. Now, he's in his 90s and not very internet savvy, and I asked him for help in solving the mysteries of these books that he allegedly wrote. He, he mailed me back a one-sentence response. It said, Tom, these are not my books. Signed, Ralph Hayes. So his name's on the books, Eric. I told jury about Ralph's response, and jury allowed the idea that this Finland sex book publisher may have just been lazy in attributing authorship to Ralph Hayes, and in any case, probably just bootlegged the books without paying the author, whoever that was, or the American publisher for the reprint rights. Now, Eric, you have a sizable library of Ralph Hayes novels. You are this guy's biographer, basically, at paperbackwarrior.com. Do either of these plot descriptions ring a bell to you? No, and going back to uh, the statement that he sent to you, I've noticed that sometimes he won't he won't respond to things that that are controversial. I guess, um, like I asked him about Manor Books, right, possibly being part of the mob, and if if he if he had any commentary on that, and he he, re- he skipped the question, like he just, he didn't want to talk about it. Interesting. So um, you think he may be a little embarrassed about sex books that he wrote? I would think so, but I've never seen a lesbian scene in any of his books. Hmm. So I find that a little bit odd. And, you know, Norman Daniels was writing hospital sex books around that time. A yeah. lot of people were. And, yeah, a lot of people there's were. That whole, there's a whole nursing <laughs> pulp subgenre. <laughs> right. We'll be doing an episode on that in 2028. Maybe they slapped Ralph Hayes' name on it. I, it, I don't know. It's possible. That's, that's one of Jury's theories, is that, that they bootleg some American book and they just grab some random author's name. But these books clearly existed in the yeah. U.S. before they were translated into Finland. So we have a pretty astute readership. Uh, as you can imagine, I'm in the dark here as well. So if any Paperback Warrior listeners can name the books, this guy, Jury, who's a good dude, would really appreciate it. Hit us up on Facebook, uh, our Paperback Warrior page, or at paperbackwarrioryahoo.com, and let me know your theories. And Eric, if you promise to play the transition music, I promise to knock your socks off with this feature. You better deliver the goods. <laughs> My feature today is on a series character named Race Williams, who arose from the pulp magazines, but his short stories, novellas, and novels have remained in print for the better part of a century. I've been reading this reference book called Detectives in the Shadows, from uh, published by John Hopkins University Press. Uh, it's written by a woman named Susanna Lee. It's a great resource detailing the history and providing literary analysis of early hard-boiled detectives from crime fiction. Now, a little bit of history. The very first modern detective story was Murders on the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe from 1841. This evolved into a tradition of armchair detectives using deductive reasoning to solve crimes without really getting much blood on their knuckles. You could think Sherlock Holmes as being the prototypical example of this. Now, the term hard-boiled to describe a human's character goes back to the 1890s. According to newspapers at the time, a U.S. senator asked a witness about crime policy and used the term hard-boiled criminal in his question. In 1919, there was a sensational news story about an army lieutenant who ran a POW camp in France who got in trouble for torturing prisoners. The American press dubbed him hard-boiled Smith. By 1921, newspapers were using the term hard-boiled to describe any tough cop. Which brings us forward to December 1922. There was this pulp magazine called Black Mask, and an author named Carol John Daly. He was a guy. He had his first story published. It was called The False Burton Combs. The narrator was a gun-toting gentleman adventurer who talked tough and carried a gun. Uh, The character had no name, but the story was very popular. So Daly sells another story to Black Mask in May 1923 called Three Gun Terry, starring a character named Terry Mack, who was an honest-to-goodness private detective. The story was the first one to establish the model for the hard-boiled private eye story. There's a solid argument that this was the very first private eye story in the hard-boiled tradition. Terry Mack, this character, was brought back in 1924 for in a story called Action, Action. 
So if you're looking to crown any one character as the first hard-boiled detective, it would have to be Terry Mack. Now, the author, Carol John Daly, basically launched this genre that carried forward to Philip Marlowe, Mike Hammer, Spencer for Hire, Mac Boland. We are talking about patient zero in the world of hard-boiled fiction here. Daly then raises the stakes and writes his first story starring a hard-boiled private detective named Race Williams in June 1923. Now, Race Williams was essentially just Terry Mack under a different name. The story was called Knights of the Open Palm, and Race Williams takes on the Ku Klux Klan to save a kidnapped child in the story. Now, the editor of Black Mask was a guy named George Sutton, and he did not like the character or story, but the fans sure did. Race was a super popular guy with readers of Black Mask, and they demanded more of his adventures. I read this story, Knights of the Open Palm, and I'm going to tell you about it a little later in the feature. Now, fellow author Dashell Hammett was basically nipping at Carol John Daly's heels. In October 2013, Hammett published his first continental op story, Arson Plus, about an unnamed private eye for the Continental Detective Agency. It was also published in Black Mask, but listen, fair is fair. Race Williams was the first private eye series that ever took off. The editor of Black Mask was this George Sutton. I mentioned him before. He did not like Race Williams' stories or the characters. In fact, here's what Mr. Sutton told the author, Carol John Daly. It just so happens that Mr. Sutton has a very similar voice to Ralph Hayes, Eric. Oh, okay. I, yeah, it's I, funny. I, it's I, funny I, the way that works. He said, he said, he said this. <clears throat> it's like this, Daly. I am an editor of this magazine to see it make money, to see circulation go up. I don't like these stories. But the readers do. I have never received so many letters about a single character before. Write them. I don't like them, but I'll buy them and I'll print them. And if you do bad work, you'll be the one to suffer. You can make money with this boy, Williams. Everyone seems to like him but me. So, right, so the editor's the business guy. He doesn't like the character Race Williams, but he decides to go forward and get more stories because the readers are just gaga over this character. So daily, what does he do? He keeps writing Race Williams stories, and he begins writing serialized novels starring Race Williams that appear in Black Mask. And Black Mask made Daly's writing the cornerstone of their marketing. They once read, uh, they once ran an ad inviting readers to, quote, fulfill that secret desire for an exciting life. Satisfy your cravings for thrill. Let Race Williams and Terry Mack kill your enemies for you. Magazine sales spiked every time Daly and Race Williams' name appeared on the cover of Black Mask. Now, the editors of the magazine were nurturing Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler as, uh, as the talents that they're bringing up from, uh, from the miners, basically. And they kind of resented the meat and potatoes action writer like Daly for being more popular than Hammett and Chandler. But Daly kept on writing and writing. So the first Race Williams novel was called The Snarl of the Beast from 1927. And Race Williams offers the following monologue on page one. Right and wrong are not written on the statutes for me, nor do I find my code of morals in the essays of long-winded professors. My ethics are my own. I'm not saying they're good, and I'm not admitting they're bad. And what's more, I'm not interested in the opinions of others. Now, see, when I read that, Eric, I'm reminded of the vigilante ethic popularized by Don Pendleton in the Executioner novel starring Mac Boland decades later with a cadre of imitators that Pendleton inspired. I can see that. Yeah. So there are a lot of Race Williams stories published in Black Mask through 1934 including a handful of full novels that were originally serialized in the magazine that were later published on their own. Poll of Black Mask readers picked Race Williams as their favorite character, beyond uh, anything Dash L. Hammett could do, beyond Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe. In 1934, November 1934 specifically, Daly, he was feeling disrespected by his authors at Black Mask because they didn't respect him. So he left the magazine, but he brought the Race Williams character with him to an upstart rival magazine called Dime Detective for about 19 more stories through November 1939. 
After that, Daly kept writing Race Williams stories and selling them to a variety of other magazines, including Thrilling Detective, Smashing Detective Stories, and others. By the mid-1940s, the Race Williams stories had largely fallen out of favor with readers, probably because so many other and better hard-boiled private eye characters had popped up by them. Daly moved to California to work on comic books and film scripts, and this coincided with Mickey Spillane's Mike Hammer series becoming a monster success by building on the character and the formula that Daly had developed for Race Williams. Daly sees the success of Mickey Spillane had with Mike Hammer, and he remarked to an, a reporter, I'm broke, but this guy gets rich writing about my detective? Hmm. Spillane sees this comment in the paper and writes Daly a fan letter saying that Race Williams actually served as a model for the creation of Mike Hammer. Now, when Daly's literary agent sees this fan letter, she gets the ball rolling on a civil lawsuit mm. accusing Mickey Spillane of plagiarism. When Daly catches wind of this proposed lawsuit, he fires his literary agent, saying that he hadn't gotten a fan letter in years, and he sure as hell isn't about to sue anybody who had actually taken the time to write one. <laughs> now, there, was, there was enough demand for Daly to write a few more Race Williams stories into the 1950s, and the last one published was in May 1955. It was called Head Over Homicide, and it was published in Smashing Detective Story magazines. Daly died three years later in 1958, totally broke and mostly mm. forgotten. That's sad. Yeah. Now, many critics, including heavy hitters like Otto Penzler, Ron Goulart, and William Nolan, have called Daly's writing unreadable. However, there's a great article online by, by uh, none other than friend of the show, Stephen Mertz, that originally ran in the May 1978 issue of the Mystery Fancier. That makes a compelling case that Race Williams was awesome and should, and should be spoken about with the same reverence that people discuss Dashiell Hammett. Now, I love Stephen Mertz's writing. He was a protege of Don Pendleton, and he wrote some of the best books in Mac Boland's Executioner series. Meanwhile, the worst book I read last year was the first book in the John Easy Private Detective series by that hack Ron Goulart. Who are you going to believe? Here's who you should believe, listener. Me. I read a copy of Carol John Daly's first Race Williams novella called Knights of the Open Palm from May 1923. So this story is 98 years old. As the story opens, the narrator, Race Williams, explains that he's a private investigator who splits the difference between cops and crooks. A client named Thompson comes to Race's office seeking to engage him to rescue his kidnapped 17-year-old son from the Ku Klux Klan. Now, the kid may have information about a recent Klan murder, which prompted the abduction. So that's the setup. The KKK must have been rather powerful in 1923 because Mr. Thompson is surprised that Race accepts the assignment to defy the Klan and rescue the boy. After an informant in a tavern teaches Ray the secret handshake, as well as clan buzzwords, Race decides that the best way to find the missing kid is to infiltrate the clan at a meeting in full robe and hood. So it's off to the small farming town of Clinton, which is a village in the grip of the shadowy hooded menace. It doesn't take long at all for things to come to a series of confrontations between Race and the local KKK muscle. Eric, for a story written nearly a hundred years ago, Daly's writing is so fresh. His hard-boiled language, where subjects and verbs don't always agree, must have been groundbreaking at the time, and it really recalls the kind of bragging, tough guy patter later imitated by uh, you know Mike Hammer and Shell Scott and, and many of the other characters that we love. Race is a fantastic character. He's funny. He's fearless. He's confident. I'm reading this story, and I, I find myself like nodding along and muttering, like, hell yeah, along the way. Here's an example. Some tough guys are warning Race that he better stop his investigation of the Klan and get out of town. Race has this amazing monologue that says, So you have a gun that shoots in one second, huh? Well, let me give you some advice. If that's the best you can do, you'd better keep that gun parked. I'm telling you flat that you'll be exactly one half second too late. If you don't believe me, try it. Your friends can carry you out. 
See, Eric, I'm just a total sucker for this ba- to that badass like dialogue, and I love this story so much. After reading Knights of the Open Palm, it's easy to see why Race Williams captured the public's imagination a century ago. This character, at least in this one story I read, really lives at the intersection of Mike Hammer and Mac Bolin. Again, I thought the story was amazing, and it really made me want to read more Race Williams stories and novels. I fall squarely into the camp of Steve Mertz in this debate. I want to stress that I'm not even saying this book is good for 1923. I'm saying that this novel kicks ass today for modern readers who like Mickey Spillane and Don Pendleton's Executioner books. Now, the listener right now is probably asking a very good question. How can I read these Race Williams stories? Now, I see them now and then compiled as entries into various anthologies that have been uh, released over the years. But I think the most comprehensive way to read the Race Williams stories are these four volumes of reprints from Altus Press. You can find them by searching Race Williams or Carol John Daly on Amazon or just a Google search. Volume one is called them that lives by the guns. It has the first 16 race Williams stories from 1923 and 1926. Um, I don't have a copy because it's $30. On the other hand, Amazon says it's 684 pages long and weighs three pounds. I mean, 16 stories. And they're kind of like novellas. Uh, They're not super short. Volume two is called the snarl of the beast. It's also $30. That one's 492 pages. And it compiles the next batch of Race Williams stories that stretch from 1927 to 1929. Volume 3 is called Shooting Out of Turn and covers from 1929 to 1931. It's also 30 bucks. Volume 4 is called If Death is Respectable. It catches him uh, from 1932 to 34 until he stopped writing stories for Black Mask. Again, even that with that one, we're still looking at 450 pages for 30 bucks. These volumes look great. And if I ever make it big in podcasting or interpretive dancing, I'm going to shell out the money and buy them. However, a cheaper but less comprehensive way to get into Race Williams is by buying the stories in smaller packs from Black Mask, who has made a ton of them available as Kindle ebooks and audiobooks. For those, you get like 200 pages of Race Williams for $5. Or if you're a non reader, just hit the audiobooks. My new love of Race Williams has caused me to seek out Carol John Daly's other popular characters from the Pulps. He has a series uh, called V Brown, V is V-E-E, that he started when he went over to Dime Detective. Now, V Brown is a dude named Vivian, but kind of like uh, Daly is a dude named Carol. The setup is that V is a detective assigned to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. He's also fabulously rich because he's got a side hustle as a composer of sentimental songs. It's sort of like Dirty Harry meets George Gershwin. In his crime-fighting life, he shoots and kills an astounding number of bad guys while solving mysteries. The narrator of the V. Brown books is his friend, Dean Condon, who serves as his sidekick on these adventures. There were 18 V. Brown novellas from Dime Detective from 1932 to 1936, and they are collected in two volumes called The Complete Cases of V. Brown from Altus Press, uh, both available on Amazon. I have the first volume, and I'm going to read it this year, and I'll let you know what I think. Now, Daly's other recurring character, I'm going to hand this across to you, is, called, is named Satan Hall. That's right. His first name was Satan And uh, you can think of Satan Hall as being the prototype for Dirty Harry. His whole shtick is that he uses his police badge to commit legal murders of bad guys without a trial or any due process. And what he does is he doctors up the police reports to cover up each murder as taking place when the subject was, say, resisting arrest or in the perpetration of a crime. Now, Mysterious Press put out a compilation of four Satan Hall novels from Dime Detective Magazine a few years back. It was called The Adventures of Satan Hall. It's out of print now, and it's actually kind of expensive. I found a cheap copy and ordered it. It hasn't arrived yet. But in 2020, Steger Books, and I just handed this to you, released a daily novel starring Satan Hall called Satan's Vengeance. And that one's uh, still in print. It originally appeared serialized in 1936, And this new Steger Books release is the first time it's ever appeared in one volume. So I bought it, and it looks awesome. I hope it sells well, so Steger Books will release the novellas as well. 
Uh, there were 24 Satan Hall novellas, and then just this one novel that you're holding. What's your impression looking at it? Yeah, it's great. I really like the uh, packaging, and I like the layout. Um, yeah, it looks great, and this just came out last year. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty much brand new. And it, again, it's the fr- I can't believe this, but it's the first time anyone's compiled the the one and only Satan Hall novel into a, a book. It just it, it was just sort of yellowing on people's shelves as uh, serialized in, in, from the magazine. Yeah, so uh, thanks to Ed Hulse and his essay, uh, the V. Brown Master of Melodies, uh, for all the info on Carol John Daly, as well as Steve Mertz, who defended the guy so passionately and correctly, I will update you as I read more of his stuff. Eric, I think it's time for you to give us a book review. Yeah, so today I'm going to review The Big Kiss-Off by Day Keen. It's a paperback original from 1954, and last month it was reprinted by Stark House Press, the reprint not only contains this novel, but also Keene's 1953 book, Dead Man's Tide, and his 1955 novel, The Dangling Carrot. But in this book's opening pages, a man named Cade Kane docks his boat in a swampy town called Bay Parish. In backstory, we learn that Kane grew up in Bay Parish, which just sits south of New Orleans on the Gulf. Uh, Kane joined the Air Force and served in the Korean War, but his jet was shot down over North Korea, and he became a prisoner of war. After fish heads and rice and a really harsh existence, Kane has now bought a boat, and he's returned to Bay Parish, his hometown, after a 12-year absence. Most of the town is really happy to see him, but just in the first afternoon of being back, he's ordered out of town by the local sheriff. Puzzled by this warning... He returns back to his boat, and he finds this really beautiful Spanish woman named Mimi stealing his food. That's like a heck of a homecoming for this guy. After scolding her, he learns that Mimi is an illegal alien who's in U.S. waters searching for her husband, an American soldier named Moran that apparently married her while being stationed near her family's home. After attempting to find Moran in Bay Parish, Mimi and Kane return to the boat and find that someone has shot the sheriff. In an effort to frame Kane, the bloody corpse has been placed on his bunk with a murder weapon. Hightailing it out of town, Kane and Mimi now must dispose of the body and find the answer to this wild and riveting murder mystery. Tom, there's so much to like about Day Kane's swampy crime noir. This book still uses that overutilized formula of the wanted man on the run to prove his innocence kind of thing, but... I guess a lot of us would say it's the waking up by the dead broad and then having to... I mean, that that's the, both plots have been beat to death. <laughs> yes. But yeah, they can be done well or they can be done poorly. As long as you're willing to accept that you're in for this this, this tired yes. setup, you could still have a good time. And this one is a good time. And uh, there's a lot of emphasis on a backstory between Kane and his ex-wife Janice, as well as Mimi's immigration troubles and her speculative marriage. The author combines this deep-seated mystery with a nautical nuance and really places it on a fast-paced narrative that's just brimming over with really interesting characters. But man, the sexual tension between Kane and Mimi is just so intense. And I couldn't help but imagine that Mimi was like a young Eva Longoria. Um, and Kane's use of her innocence and like her inability to adapt to American lifestyle just adds more flirtation to it. And I read Ed Lacey's 1959 novel Blonde Bait a couple years ago. And I think he borrowed a lot of the ideas from this book. Um, the idea of a fugitive on the run and his boat with a busty babe is probably a, a literary trend of the 1940s and 1950s, but nevertheless, Day Keen really nailed it. I thought the ending was a little too convenient, but it didn't distract from my overall enjoyment. This is just another good crime noir from Day Keen, and I mostly like everything he's done. Again, you can get this one right now on Amazon. It's called The Big Kiss Off by Day Keen. Tom, take it away. All right, cool. So uh, I'm going to review a book called The Da Vinci Rose by Archie O'Neill. Now, the real author of this book was a guy named Jim Hennigan, who lived from 1919 to 1984. He was a well-known columnist for The Hollywood Reporter, and he had a reputation for bluntness and candor that often rustled the feathers of show business industry establishment. He also worked as a rewrite man for Paramount and was an executive for John Wayne's production company. Now, under the pseudonym of Archie O'Neill, he authored this five-book adventure series starring starring a character named Jeff Pride, and he earned the admiration of Mickey Spillane. The first novel in the series is the one I'm reviewing. It's 1973's The Da Vinci Rose. Now, Jeff Pride is a former international private investigator who actually left the job and became a travel agent back when that was a thing. 
So he travels around the world with his sexy Asian-American secretary sidekick named Cherry. Now, Cherry wants to get romantic with Jeff, but he thinks that would be unwise for a number of valid reasons that I'll let Jeff explain when you read the book. Cherry's flirtation with her boss is this running gag in the novel and probably the whole series. In any case, she's kind of a perfect sidekick for a book like this. As the paperback opens, Jeff is in Israel at a hotel when he awakens to find the corpse of a guy in a suit lying on the ground next to him, uh, next to his bed. So that same kind of setup we've seen a million times. Sometimes it's a a lady, sometimes it's a guy. An altercation in the room brings Israeli police into the picture. Now, the cops take Jeff's passport away pending further investigation, and for his part, Jeff figures that the situation has probably arose from his heroic past rather than his benign current job as a travel consultant. The killing, violence, and skullduggery all concerns a missing art piece, a ceramic rose handcrafted by Leonardo da Vinci. Now, dangerous people think that the dead guy in the hotel room may have delivered this rose to Jeff, who actually knows nothing about the damn thing. One thing leads to another, and Jeff agrees to find the ceramic rose. Anyway, so I really enjoyed the Da Vinci Rose, primarily because Jeff Pride is such a great narrator. The action took the character all over Israel, combining a treasure hunt adventure with a hard-boiled mystery. And I'm looking forward to reading the next installment. I I definitely recommend this. And again, the book is The Da Vinci Rose by Archie O'Neill. The book has not been, none of the books in the series have been reprinted or digitized, so you're going to have to find this paperback wherever you get your 48-year-old books. I want to thank the Spy Guys and Gals blog for filling me in on some of the background on this series. And so with that, Eric, why don't, we, uh, why don't you talk us out this time? Let's wrap it up. Yeah, thanks again for listening to the Paperback Warrior podcast. Join us every Monday for a new episode, and if you're hungry for more, check out our blog at paperbackwarrior.com where we have an archive with thousands of vintage book reviews by me and Tom, as well as new content every day. On behalf of Tom, this is Eric signing off and saying we will see you next week on the Paperback Warrior podcast.